All right, awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our webinar about eating disorders and intimacy. My name is Meredith Riddick, and I'm really excited to share um, just a lot of this with you guys, no matter you know where you're coming from. If you're a professional who treats eating disorders or who's interested in treating eating disorders, or if you are someone working on a recovery from an eating disorder, or maybe you are a partner, friend, or family member of someone with an eating disorder. So this is really for everybody. Um, we are going to spend roughly an hour um, kind of going over a lot of different information that I've kind of just pulled together um, surrounding intimacy and kind of how I use it in working with my clients. I've worked with eating disorders for over 12 years now. I have experience at the residential setting as well as at the um, outpatient setting, which is where I am now. I've mostly done private practice the last decade. And I used to be in Texas, and now I'm in Virginia. So um, I'm excited to uh, just kind of share with you guys uh, just kind of some experiences I've had with clients over the years and how I tend to talk about these things in therapy sessions. So that being said, I want to have like a little disclaimer. This is really just meant to be educational and providing information. By no means is this intended to replace therapy or supervision, consultation, anything like that. So just kind of want to want to share this information with you guys. So let me share my screen so you guys can see the PowerPoint. We will do that. And all right, perfect. All right, so let's talk about sex, baby. Eating disorders and intimacy, a brief glimpse into body image, attachment, and trust in relationships. So we'll kind of come at this from a few different angles. Um, one thing I want to share with you guys as we talk about some of this is just owning my own privileges. Um, you know, there's always you know, some limitations whenever we try and educate and inform on a topic that maybe we haven't necessarily experienced everything. And so I certainly have many privileges in my life just being um, white, being a majority culture in terms of upper middle class, um, education, you know, that kind of thing. So please keep that in mind just as we talk about some things in here that I have some limitations in my experiences. Um, so intimacy is a common concern that really comes up a lot in working with my clients with eating disorders. Um, you know, we'll talk a lot about normalizing experiences with regards to physical and emotional intimacy. Um, and so I want to define those a little bit. Of course, I think a lot of people, when we talk about intimacy, maybe immediately think of the physical. We think of essentially sex. Intimacy can sometimes be another word for sex, even though really in the context of this presentation, I'm talking about sex and so much more. So in the physical aspects of intimacy, we're looking at body image. We're looking at maybe some uncertainty or avoidance of physical intimacy. We're looking at experiences with teasing or bullying any kind of violation of trust, abuse. Uh, we maybe even are looking at moral, religious uh, beliefs or opinions, how we were raised, that kind of thing. So there's a lot that comes up in uh, the aspect of physical intimacy in a relationship. I also am going to talk about emotional intimacy because especially as a therapist, this is like the deeper parts of physical intimacy, in my opinion. So emotional intimacy in my work with clients with eating disorders focuses so much on vulnerability, connection, openness, honesty, um, and just kind of healthy communication in our relationships with others. Also want to make sure that we understand intimacy at varying levels can is, is not just romantic. It might be with ourselves, with friends, with family, with um, business associates, work, uh, coworkers, that kind of thing. So we're kind of covering the, gam the gamut with intimacy here. So one thing I like to share is just kind of like how this can look for different situations. So it's very possible our physical and emotional intimacy looks different depending on the context of the relationship. So this is just kind of a simple chart that looks at different types of relationships. So if we go a little deeper here, 
we maybe kind of notice some similarities with our romantic partner, for example, like with physical intimacy, maybe we are totally okay there. We're able to have sex and enjoy it. It's a wonderful, pleasurable experience. And maybe along with that, our emotional intimacy is kind of at the same level. We tell our partners everything and there's a close connection there emotionally. But perhaps with our family, our physical intimacy only goes so far as maybe like a quick hug. Emotional intimacy maybe matches that and we keep it pretty surface. Maybe similar with friends. We're okay with just kind of a friendly hug and we'll tell our friends some things, but not everything. We maybe don't go as deep as some other things. With work relationships, maybe physical intimacy is absolutely not present. You know, we're not even okay with hug, handshake fist bump, whatever, you know, we're pretty um, kind of hands off there. And maybe same with emotional intimacy, it's work related only. We don't have pictures of our partners, of our kids. Um, we don't really talk much about what we do on the weekends or whatever. It's just kind of work related only in terms of our emotional intimacy. So one thing I often ask my clients is, how does your relationship with food mimic your relationship with other people? And so this is just an example. Maybe with our romantic partner where we have a pretty healthy, intimate relationship, our relationship with food mimics that in the sense that we eat regularly. We're okay there. We're not engaging in a lot of behaviors. There's safety in normalized eating patterns. But with our family, because there's kind of some hesitation with physical and emotional intimacy, Maybe when we're around our family, we're eating only safe foods, or maybe we're doing that and then we binge right after. Same thing with friends. There's some limitations with intimacy, and so how that looks with our food is maybe we're just eating a small variety in front of our friends. We'll go out with them, but we're only going to certain restaurants, or we're only ordering salads, something like that. And then maybe with our coworkers or our boss, like a work relationship, because there's very little intimacy or no intimacy there, our food, maybe our relationship with food maybe mimics that by eating in private only, or maybe binge eating in private, or maybe we skip meals or snacks. Maybe we're someone who um, we don't ever go on to lunch with coworkers or happy hours or dinners or whatever. Maybe we don't even go into the lunchroom other than just to heat up our food really fast. Um, maybe we eat in our cars, you know, go to lunch by ourselves. And I mean these things as patterns. Of course, doing, um, you know, eating in your car, or going out on your own, saying no to, you know, some outings is totally okay sometimes. But when these things are a pattern, maybe our intimacy is really kind of showing up also in our relationship with food, depending on the context of the relationship. So that's just kind of one thing to keep in mind. I, when I was putting together this presentation, I thought, gosh, you know, talking about intimacy and eating disorders and physical intimacy and emotional intimacy, I just kind of thought I cannot talk about this without acknowledging some uh, social justice uh, kind of viewpoints. And so I really think that we need to look at this as a factor in intimacy related concerns just because of the oppression attitudes and beliefs that can come up a lot with social justice and also privilege as it plays plays out. So the hashtag Me Too movement that I think we saw a lot in 2018, you are not alone. This is a really powerful movement, um, particularly for women at this time, you know, the purpose of it really trying to give women a voice for a lot of things that have happened that maybe no one knows and a lot of things that happen frequently that people maybe don't realize in some ways are kind of a normal daily or weekly experience in a lot of women's lives. Um, we also threw out, you know, gosh, more and more over the, over the last, you know, 50, 20, whatever years, you know, a lot more has been revealed. We know more about sexual abuse in the Catholic church and more recently, more evidence of sexual violence in black churches. And we have to look at where does privilege play a role in turning a blind eye engaging in disbelief, bribing people, that kind of thing. You know, privilege really looks at anyone within a majority culture. And so, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the times, typically, not always, so if you fall into this category, this is not a generalization, um, like for everybody, but a lot of times the most majority, people in the most majority cultures, such as a white male who is cisgender, heterosexual, 
maybe is so removed from a lot of these hap- a lot of these things happening to more minority cultures that there is some disbelief or there's um, some disengagement from these things happening. So the hashtag Me Too movement really brought a significant voice to a lot of these things. We have a long ways to go. I will say that, um, but I think working on it. LGBTQ plus population. So, you know, I think that there's a lot that the LGBTQ plus population really experiences that can get in the way of physical and emotional intimacy. Certainly our earlier life experiences influence and cultivate how we experience our bodies and how we relate to others. So this is really interesting. Among LGBTQ plus population, there's a 40% suicide attempt rate and family acceptance is the most important aspect of mental health. When I read the study that talked about this, I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, I understand that there are a lot of families out there that really struggle with the acceptance piece. And if you knew that your child or family member was 40% likely to attempt suicide, I just feel like that's you know, huge information to know in terms of your involvement and acceptance is really critical. You know, and I try and be careful. Acceptance doesn't always mean agree. We, we can love our family members, our friends, and we don't have to agree with everything. I, I'd be hard pressed to find a friend, you know, family member who agrees with every single thing of all their friends and family, right? That's so unrealistic. And so I think in many ways, we need to kind of understand how acceptance can play a role in these kinds of things. And even as I'm talking about that, I'm, I'm, you know, wondering, gosh, is even that a privileged statement, you know, for me that, hey, we can do better, we can do this, when in reality, a lot of LGBTQ plus are not experiencing this. And it's not as easy as maybe it comes out of my mouth, for sure, you know. So um, there, unfortunately, there are high levels of family rejection during adolescence among LGBT young adults. Um, There's an 8.4 times more likely to uh, rate of having to, uh, sorry, 8.4 times more likely to report having attempted suicide. They are 5.9 times more likely to report high levels of depression, 3.4 times more likely to use illegal drugs, and 3.4 times more likely to report having engaged in unprotected sex, so some riskier behaviors. So when we think about that with this population, what do you think about intimacy? Do you think it's and do you think it's easy to engage in healthy physical intimacy or healthy emotional intimacy when we've experienced high amounts of rejection, when we are highly depressed, when we are more likely to be using drugs or having unprotected sex, that kind of thing? These things really get in the way of building healthy, intimate relationships, not to mention eating disorders um, are more likely to occur in LGBTQ plus um, adolescents, I believe. It might maybe extends to adults as well um, than uh, heterosexual, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm blinking on all my terminology now, but anyway, those more of the majority culture with LGBTQ plus population. So I don't wanna neglect talking about men. So wait, what about men? A man's relationship with physical and emotional intimacy is also very much affected by an eating disorder and or poor body image. Of note, men with eating disorders may have much lower testosterone levels. This is one of the main medical tests associated with this population. So of course, lower testosterone levels can really impact satisfaction with sexual intimacy, both with the individual and his partner. It maybe increases um, low sex drive, you know, maybe there's just not really a desire to engage in the physical intimacy part of things. We also need to acknowledge there's still a lot of stigma around men and talking about feelings and any other kind of emotionally intimate topic, right? There are common generalizations, men just want sex all the time and women don't, and that's just not accurate. I was even on, um, I think, kind of a Facebook group that I'm in with a bunch of therapists and someone kind of reaching out and saying, gosh, I have a female client whose husband doesn't really want to have sex and she really does. And I just haven't really run into it. It's usually the other way around. Right. And it was interesting because this person was really putting themselves out there and I think acknowledging their assumption or generalization. And unfortunately, other therapists kind of jumped on that. But the reality is, is that it's not accurate. That's very much a generalization. So men who may have a lower sex drive can often feel a sense of shame and struggle to openly process this. 
and it can leave him confused, his partner confused, all of that. Um, also, we certainly need to acknowledge that past sexual trauma or even long-term pornography use can also impact physical and emotional intimacy, uh, can cause maybe some avoidance of physical intimacy, may also cause um, kind of the opposite of avoidance, maybe more addictive kind of behaviors with physical intimacy, often not with the actual partner. Um, certainly emotional intimacy can cause a lot of disconnect there, maybe some unhealthy communication patterns, maybe again avoidance, lying, hiding, that kind of thing. So these things are important. So some of this maybe feels pretty dismal. What do we do about all of this? Well, the good news is there is hope. And I think as a therapist, I will always hold out hope for all of these things to continue to get better for all of us. It'll take us some time. I wanna talk about body image since this is a topic that comes up a lot in eating disorder recovery. I'd be hard pressed to even think about a client that this does not come up with. So with body image, we're really talking about attitudes, beliefs, and experiences we have with our physical appearance. It's particularly a hallmark concern in working with eating disorders as compared to disordered eating, the average dieter, just kind of the average person with poor body image. This is typically, um, I would say, hyper poor body image when it comes to eating disorders, more obsessiveness, more concern. So how poor body image shows up in therapy, uh, it might show up with some avoidance. You know, it might be something that the person just doesn't even want to talk about. Maybe there's someone who avoids even looking in the mirror. Um, I've even had clients who have showered with the lights off so they don't have to look at their body or taken a bath, something like that. They won't look at themselves when they change clothes, things like that. Um, and so same kind of thing in therapy, right? How these things mimic each other in our relationships. They certainly don't want to open up about this with their therapist. It could be the opposite. It could be more obsessiveness. Maybe this is someone who comes in for therapy for an eating disorder or something else, and all they want to talk about is poor body image. Maybe they don't want to talk about more of the underlying kinds of things there. Uh, and maybe all day there's just, they're inundated with hours and hours of thoughts and um, intrusive thoughts and obsessions about their appearance. A lot of judgment comes in. Mostly it's judgment of self, but also want to acknowledge that for a lot of individuals, um, when they're able to engage in open and honest communication, there's acknowledgement of, there's judgment of others as well. Um, that social comparison and am I, am I the skinniest person in the room? Um, am I the prettiest person in the room? Am I the most fit? You know, that kind of thing. And so maybe judgment of others who aren't. Uh, but again, typically that judgment is strongest with the self. There maybe is a lot of denial kind of going hand in hand with avoidance in some ways, some denial that there is poor body image um, and just some attitudes and beliefs about the physical self that maybe have gone un under the radar. Uh, poor body image can also be a scapegoat for the real fears. Um, I often have clients where they're talking about poor body image and I'm like, so let's say they want to lose 15 pounds and I'll ask, okay, well then what happens? And what do you get from that? And they'll answer, okay, what do you get from that? And what do you get from that? And almost always it goes deeper into a sense of acceptance from others. There's typically some kind of social connection that they are desiring that they feel like will get met if only their appearance changes. And maybe that's for self. Maybe then it's, I will be more confident. I will accept myself more. And so those are kind of more of the underlying issues, but a lot of times there may be a denial or avoidance of wanting to talk about that. So instead it's easier to talk about, you know, oh, these 15 pounds or 50 pounds or a hundred pounds, or, you know, I want to change this about my appearance or whatever, instead of talking about, you know, what are the experiences that have led up to feeling that way? So how poor body image shows up in life? Well, we're talking about eating disorder recovery here. So there's probably restriction, purging, binge eating, overexercising. Maybe in terms of relationships with people, there's silence. Maybe there's no silence. Maybe this is someone who just keeps talking, 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 talking as a way of avoiding dealing with a lot of this stuff. Um, maybe this is someone, again, with lots and lots of people, but never really feeling connected. Maybe this is someone with thousands of social media followers or friends or whatever, um, but they there's a lot of loneliness. They still don't really feel that connected to anybody. Or maybe there's a lot of isolation and withdrawal socially, so there's no people. 
um, through poor body image, maybe they're avoiding going to holiday parties or going to the beach or a pool party or something like that. Poor body image could show up by way of over being overly productive or procrastinating. So again, it might be being overly productive, like, well, I got to um, kind of compensate since I'm not very pretty or I'm not the thin one in the office or whatever, uh, or it could be procrastination. Like, well, you know, I don't, they're not going to think I'm attractive anyway, so why even bother putting more effort into this presentation? They're just going to be looking at how fat I am, you know, something like that. It could be no boundaries or it could be rigid boundaries. Um, there's just all sorts of life experiences that happen that really um, come out through how our body image shows up in life. Could be sexual trauma, it could be bullying, it could be, you know, well meaning but poor comments from friends, family, partners, spouses. It could be poor experiences having gone through puberty. Um, it could be, you know, really poor healthcare experiences, going into a doctor's office with very legitimate medical concerns, but the physician not getting past the weight. Those things can be traumatic for a lot of individuals and engage in a lot of these behaviors, avoidance, that kind of thing. So intimacy and the family unit. Um, oh, for some reason, my picture is not showing up there. Oh, well, it's a picture of a family in a kitchen. Um, so an individual's relationship with food and or body can also influence the intimacy of the family unit. So often my clients have questions around how the negative effects of their eating disorder or poor body image may impact or have impacted their families. Sometimes out of shame, there's avoidance of this topic, which then perpetuates more, more shame, more secretive behavior. So let me share the truth in love. Your family is absolutely impacted, whether they tell you or not. This is because they love and care for you. There's this saying that the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. So if your family is upset in any way about these kinds of things, it's usually a sign that they care a tremendous amount about you. Now, I'm not saying that the way that they express how upset they are, whether it's through avoidance or yelling or screaming or accusing or whatever, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's healthy, um, the way that they express it. But what I am trying to indicate is usually that's more of a sign that they care about you and your well-being and how that impacts the entire family. So your kids notice when you are disconnected emotionally. If you are on your cell phone all the time because you're constantly tracking your exercise or your calories, or they notice when you speak badly about yourself or your body, if you're just kind of making casual remarks that like, man, I look so fat, or does this dress, oh, this dress makes me look awful. Oh, can't believe how I look in these jeans. Oh, I'm not even going out in public, you know, things like that. When you comment negatively on others' appearance or maybe even criticize your own kid's appearance, I can't tell you how often I get calls for um, a new client whose parent is the one calling saying, you know, gosh, I'm really worried about their weight and we got to get them in, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I know that parents are well-meaning because typically there's fear there. They're worried about, oh, is my kid going to get bullied at school? You know, they're worried about that stuff. Um, but how does that come across to the kid, right? Like, I'm not good enough as I am. I'm not okay. Um, or it might even be your kid's in high school or goes to college and then comes back and their friend comes back with them. And maybe you're like, wow, she has gained a lot of weight over the last few years. It's even just seemingly benign comments like that your children notice um, and there it forms a little bit of a disconnect there, whether they say it or not. Um, also, when you eat differently or skip meals with your family, your family is imp impacted by that. The intimacy of the family, the, the cohesion, the connectedness there, it, it is impacted. Your partner maybe often knows something is amiss, but maybe just isn't sure what. They know that something's going on, but they're not sure what. And maybe there's a period of time where they're kind of oblivious to it because, you know, in my experience of working with eating disorders, I have a lot of clients who have been able to hide it for a very long time. But eventually that catches up in some way. 
So maybe it comes out just in the bedroom and you are too tired most of the time or just not really into physical intimacy. Maybe you'll say yes to a bid for physical intimacy from your partner, but you're just kind of like wanting to get it over with or you're just not super into it. Your partner can tell. And, you know, if that's going on, then it's possibly the emotional intimacy isn't always there. And so maybe your partner isn't feeling the freedom to bring that up with you. Maybe there's, oh, what if I hurt her feelings? Or what if he gets defensive? Something like that. Um, maybe your rituals around food or body prevent you from joining your partner in social activities. Um, I hear this a lot around, again, usually holiday parties, beach vacations, um, outings like that where someone will not even want to get in a bathing suit or shorts or a fancy dress or outfit because uh, they're afraid of how they look. And so they end up missing out on these things and their partner goes with someone else or by themselves. And your partner is affected by this because they care about you. They want to be with you in these things. So ideas to start repairs. So gosh, I'm just here to kind of get the ball rolling on some of these things. By no means is this the end all be all, but I am an eating disorder therapist. So we got to start with a few things first. You got to nourish your body. You know, insight is wonderful and working on a lot of these things, you know, on the inside is really good. But at the end of the day, if you have an eating disorder, you are really going to struggle with physical and emotional intimacy until you nourish your body in appropriate ways. So that might be with self-care. Um, it might be with, you know, treating your body the way you would treat your child or a best friend, eating regularly, you know what it is. Working with a dietitian can help you with what this looks like. Um, maybe it's taking medication, maybe it's going to your physician or changing physicians if you need to. Um, joyful movement, exercise is, is an important part of overall health, but how and why you exercise is often what differentiates it from healthy or unhealthy. Healthy sleep. This is really important. It's something we don't talk about enough. An adult really needs seven to eight hours of sleep per night. Um, we also need to look at how caffeine or alcohol can really impact the quality of our sleep. Um, and so I think a lot of us are so sleep deprived these days and that impacts how we nourish our bodies, joyful movement, our mood, that kind of thing. So getting back into healthy sleep routine as much as we can. Um, physical self-care. This ranges anywhere from baths and lotions to wearing comfortable clothes to getting a new haircut. So often shame really perpetuates so many different areas of eating disorder recovery. It might be that someone doesn't even feel deserving of buying new clothes or buying clothes that actually fit. Maybe it's like, I'm so mad at myself for gaining weight. I'm just going to squeeze into my old clothes. So it'll motivate me to lose some weight, you know? Um, but that's not really taking care of our physical well-being. Communication. This is more the inside stuff. So being able to have an open dialogue about these things, engaging in assertiveness, uh, having a sense of humor. Sometimes some of us take things way too seriously. And so maybe a therapeutic opportunity there is utilizing a sense of humor, giving the benefit of the doubt when appropriate. Uh, yeah, when appropriate. So that's one thing. This is something you'll want to talk about with your own individual therapist, you know, and I don't know the situation you guys are all in or what your clients are going through, but these are just some ideas of starting emotional intimacy repairs. Um, obviously, sometimes we need to not worry about repairs. We need to sever a relationship, something like that. I totally understand that sometimes that is the best thing to do for our own care. So I also want to come at this from the angle of attachment theory, specifically John Bowlby's attachment theory. And um, this kind of poses this initial question um, with babies who are zero to 18 months to two years. Um, essentially, the theory states that a close, the close emotional bond um, between a parent or caregiver and their children is responsible for the bond that develops between adults in emotionally intimate relationship. So the base question is, is the attachment figure nearby, accessible, and attentive? If the child perceives the answer to the question to be yes, he or she feels loved, secure, and confident, and behaviorally is likely to explore his or her environment relationships in this way. 
If the answer is no, the baby may develop what's called anxious resistant attachment style. And there's kind of some different names for this. I'm just using three particular ones. We've already talked about the secure attachment, but um, just using three. But there, you, if you research this, you might find other names for it. But basically in this one, the baby is ill at ease initially and upon separation from the attachment figure and and upon separation from the attachment figure will become very distressed when the attachment figure returns. So like just say dropping off at daycare and coming back, that kind of thing. The baby has a difficult time being soothed and may exhibit conflicting behaviors of desiring comfort, but also punishing the attachment figure for leaving. As an adult, these individuals may worry others do not love them completely and become very frustrated when attachment needs go unmet. Another example of the answer is no is called anxious avoidant attachment. So in this situation, the baby isn't too distressed from the separation of the attachment figure, but may actively avoid seeking contact with the attachment figure upon return. So think about picking them up at daycare or something like that. And a lot of kids will come, you know, running and hugging mommy, daddy, you know, whatever. And so glad to see you. This might be a baby or a toddler who is, you know, they see you and they're like, oh yeah, okay. But they keep playing in a cordoner over here. As an adult, these individuals may appear to not care too much about close relationships and avoid feeling dependent on others and do not want others to be too dependent on them. So we already talked if the answer is, is yes, then typically a secure attachment will be developed. Now, this looks like the baby is upset when the attachment figure leaves, but is easily comforted when the attachment figure returns. As an adult, this individual is confident that others will be there for them when needed and is open to depending on others and others depending on them. So I like to also look at this in the context of relationship with food, right? Think about this, like, what do you think this might look like if we're talking about this, if we're talking about attachment as it relates to relationship with food? Let's go back. So anxious resistant. So may exhibit conflicting behaviors of desiring comfort, but also punishing the attachment figure for leaving. Um, as adults may worry, others do not love them completely and become very frustrated when attachment needs go unmet. So to me, this push-pull reminds me a lot of binge eating and pur purging. When I see this kind of attachment in my adult clients, sometimes it might be, you know, binging on a new relationship and you spend all your time with that person and oh my gosh, this net new best friend or this new dating partner. Oh my gosh, this is going to last for a lifetime. Oh my gosh, I never met someone like this, whatever. And then maybe all of a sudden that partner or that friend doesn't text you you back right away. Maybe you guys spend every day together and then one day the friend's like, oh, hey, I've got this work thing. I can't do it tonight. So maybe the person with the eating disorder ends up kind of purging, you know, and they get back at that person. And so maybe they cancel the next time or maybe, you know, they punish them by not even reaching out for a couple of days or something. So maybe that looks like food, you know, binging and purging, something like that. The behaviors. Anxious avoidant. So may actively avoid seeking contact with the attachment figure upon return. Um, they appear not to care too much about close relationships and avoid feeling dependent on others and do not want others to be too dependent on them. Does this sound like restriction to you guys? Because that's kind of what it sounds like to me. This, the res restrictive behaviors around food um, or even engaging in a lot of obsessive over-exercise, compulsive exercise, that really takes away from relationships, right? I think social isolation, withdrawal, that kind of thing. So how do we work on building trust in self and others? Because I think that this is a huge part of building emotional intimacy. So awareness. I am so huge on self-awareness, you know, because none of us are perfect. You know, I kind of think that we're all going to be in a, you know, ongoing growth process, which I think is a good thing. Um, but I think learning to have a self-awareness is really good. So often out of our shame, we can go into just this you know, blaming ourselves or blaming others, you know, and I think having that self-awareness where we can hold space for like our experiences, maybe without blame can be helpful. Having healthy exposures. So may, again, this is something go over with your individual therapist, but 
you know, maybe you haven't had a lot of healthy physical intimacy um, with yourself, you know, and so maybe there's healthy exposures of exploring what's it like to think about something, what's it like to read about healthy physical intimacy, maybe what's it like to even to explore yourself physically. Um, maybe there hasn't been a lot of exposures there uh, in building that with your partner. Um, acceptance. Acceptance is one of those things that kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, doesn't have to mean agreement, doesn't have to mean it's easy, um, just sometimes can be an ongoing process so that we have realistic expectations of ourselves and others. Um, so often one of the barriers to physical or emotional intimacy might be that we have unrealistic expectations. We are inundated with images or media that make this all look so easy and happily ever after. And while I'm all for a happy ending in certain things like movies, TV shows, whatever, at the end of the day, it can really cause a lot of unrealistic expectations. And so I think of acceptance as having good enough relationships, you know, I think communication is a key to this, having that open dialogue. Um, there's research that says couples who talk about their sex lives are much more satisfied with their sex lives. Um, and so Gottman has a lot of information on that, which I'll kind of share in the resource page. Um, but again, using assertiveness, having some boundaries, it's okay to have flexible boundaries, um, having a sense of humor. You know, um, I a lot of couples will do something where they'll kind of do this check-in with each other throughout the day on physical intimacy. So if one partner is, you know, kind of feeling like maybe they want to have some physical intimacy that evening, they'll kind of, you know, flirt with the other partner or, you know, some people will have a sign in the house, maybe like a little figuring on the figure figurine, is that the right word? Yeah. On a mantle, they'll like turn it a certain way if they want to have sex that night. And if the partner's up for it too, then they turn it another way or something. There's kind of all these signs. I have friends who do emojis. So they'll text each other this particular emoji if they're in the mood. And if the other partner is also in the mood, they'll text back the matching emoji. And if not, just kind of be like, you know, rain check tomorrow night or something like that, you know, but having these open dialogues to be able to talk about all this is really important. Being able to speak up for what you need. Um, a lot of times women maybe feel frustrated that um, I, what I hear in the therapy room is, is my partner is selfish. He doesn't even, he or she doesn't even consider my needs, you know, and if you're feeling that way, speak up for what you would like. If you want to be touched a certain way or um, something that you really like, speak up for that, state your needs. Um, so just some different things there. I think having a sense of humor is always really good. Sometimes with our physical intimacy, if we're taking sex really seriously and, you know, there's a sound that's made or we fall down or something like that, you know, be able to laugh about it, you know, because again, these are things that increase the emotional intimacy that we then have with our partners. So here's a list of resources. Feel free to screenshot this if you want, um, or I have my email, I think, on the last slide. If you guys want to copy these slides, just let me know. Um, so this first link on the resource page is for some information on attachment styles. And then uh, the Me Too movement is the next one. It's pronounced metrosexual.com is a really great website that I love that talks about so much on LGBTQ plus information. They have some amazing resources. Same with the family. Family Project at SFSU. They have a lot of information on family acceptance. I love Gottman. If you follow Harmony Therapy Group, especially on Facebook and Twitter a little bit, um, we post a lot of information from Gottman. Um, they are like the relationship gurus. And so they have so much cool research there. So if you're into anything like that, highly recommend their blog. And um, the nationaleatingdisorders.org, um, they have a lot of information for eating disorder stuff and body image and all of that. Named Inc. is the National, National Association for Men with Eating Disorders. They also have some great resources, books, articles on things that men experience. Um, last but definitely not least is Esther Perel. I have only just discovered Esther Perel like 
seriously in the last six months or so. Um, she is an amazing, I believe she's a sex therapist. At any rate, she is a therapist and I believe that she specializes as a sex therapist, works a lot with couples and she has an amazing podcast books. She specializes in, uh, I think more about affairs. Um, she also has some Ted talks that you can look up online. She has this really wonderful, um, intimacy inventory on her website. That's free. I think you just, she just wants your email. So sign up for that. And the thing I loved about the in inventory, I took it myself is that it's not like a scoring kind of thing. It's really just open-ended questions about intimacy in your life and also not just physical, but a variety of things. What was it like in your family of origin talking about these things? Um, how do you connect with others? And so many wonderful questions. I highly recommend estherperel.com. So where do we go from here? So depending on what you connected with the most in this presentation, I would highly recommend individual therapy as a start if you have not tried it. And if you're not sure, just do the intake, just do the first appointment, see how it goes. By no means do you have to make a long commitment to it, though it tends to work better with some consistency and with some commitment, but I'm always kind of a done is better than perfect and something is better than nothing kind of girl. So um, if you resonated just with various aspects of this with eating disorder or attachment, body image, um, emotional intimacy, even maybe limited physical intimacy, um, this is something I talk about a lot in individual therapy. Um, the therapeutic relationship is of utmost importance, so definitely do some good research on therapists and ask for referrals if at all possible. Um, I kind of already said this, but I can't recommend Esther Perel enough. She has so many resources on intimacy from TED Talks to books to her podcast. While it's not eating disorder specific, her wisdom and experience would likely resonate in some way for most of us. Open dialogue, I know I talked about this a lot, it's probably another area I would start with if you're not sure where to start. So whether this is with a therapist, a good friend, or a family member, or your partner, just start somewhere as this can begin, um, oops, I meant begin, not being, this can begin the process of shame reduction. Train your listening partner in empathic understanding if needed. Brene Brown has some wonderful resources on this. She's got this great little short video on what empathy is. So I think you can just go to brenebrown.com and she's got some great information there. Um, last but not least, behavior change. No surprise there with regards to eating disorder recovery. Slow and steady wins the race progress, not perfection, and any other common sayings I can insert here to reiterate the point, this is not a quick fix, but just starting somewhere is helpful. So thank you guys so much for hanging in there. I hope that you had a couple of takeaways from this presentation for your work with clients or your own work in your own recovery, or if you have a family member or friend going through all this, something that you can take away for yourself or share with them. We are always happy to be a resource. You can find us on harmonytherapygroup.com. We have other webinars. We have a blog. We are on social media, just kind of all over. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest in particular. We have a YouTube channel. And you can always email me personally at Meredith at HarmonyTherapyGroup.com. So thank you so much for hanging out. And I absolutely wish you guys a wonderful rest of your day, rest of your week, whatever's going on as you watch this. All right. Take care.